Bye. All right. Hello and welcome everyone to our June 13th long-term financial policy and audit subcommittee. Um, seeing a quorum, may we please take the roll. Chair Rogers. Present. Member Staff. Here. Member McDonald's. Here. I'll be able to reflect that all subcommittee members are present. Thank you very much. We will now take public comment on non-agenda matters, which is item two, but we have no members of the public that are present. So we will continue to item three, approval of the minutes. We have two, um, two sets of minutes and two uh, dates of cancellation. April 11, 2024, the cancellation, cancellation notice, March 21st, 2024, a, a regular meeting minutes, and May 9th, 2024, cancellation notice, and April 25th, 2024, special meeting minutes. Are there any corrections to the minutes? We just need to abstain from March 21st since I was not here. And I will also be abstaining from April 25th. No corrections, no corrections. All right. So um, with the abstentions, do we have to do them separately or can it just go on the record that we abstain? I think it can just go on the record that you have abstained accordingly. All right. Okay. So um, thumbs up from everyone. Minutes will be uh, passed as presented with the two abstentions for date March 21st, which would be uh, Council Member McDonald and April 25th, which would be myself. Moving on to item four, which is our scheduled items for today. We have item 4.1. Uh, the city of Santa Rosa revenue measures. It should be noted that uh, the presentation for this item was added today and will be added to the agenda following this meeting for the public to view online. Um, we apologize for the delay in getting that presentation out, um, but it will be visible um, shortly. And with that, 4.1, I'll pass it on to our chief financial officer, Alan Olson. Thank you, Chair and members of the subcommittee. Um, the purpose of this presentation is to discuss two revenue measures that we intend to uh, uh, put on the November 2024 ballot. Uh, the additional revenue that would come from these measures is part of a broader strategy to bring stability to uh, our organization, uh, especially on a fiscal matter. Other parts of that strategy includes uh, enhancing our economic development and uh, reducing expenditures. So the way that this presentation will go is I'll discuss uh, transient occupancy tax first and our proposed changes there, and then move into business tax, end with the next steps that we intend to take along this, this um, procedural steps, and then take any questions that the subcommittee may have. So next slide, please. So uh, as you are aware, the city's uh, general fund uh, has a significant structural deficit. Um, and uh, we are, uh, we have the potential of, of there being budget cuts uh, that could directly impact essential services uh, to local residents. So what we are looking to do is, as I stated before, we have a strategy to deal with this. And this is one component of that strategy. Um, what we are, are looking to do is uh, um, add, increase our transient occupancy tax by 2% and then modernize our business license tax uh, uh, by removing uh, uh, the cap, uh, the maximum tax cap, and um, uh, increase our rates for those businesses that are over that um, minimum amount. Next slide. 
So moving on to transient occupancy tax. So uh, this is uh, a tax paid by uh, people coming to hotels in Santa Rosa. Uh, the was last updated in 1993. Um, our total uh, transient occupancy tax and business improvement area fee is uh, is 14 percent. So I'll break that down. We have nine percent for TOT, uh, and then and 100 percent of that goes into the general fund. Then we have a, a Santa Rosa Tourism Business Improvement Area uh, that is 3%. So that's an assessment that's 3% that the uh, hotel owners assess themselves um, and then collect that from the lodgers that come in. And uh, that is remitted to the city of that. 30% of it uh, goes to um, economic development which is a non-general fund uh, uh, fund. And 70% of it goes out to Santa Rosa Tourism, which is a part of the Chamber of Commerce. And then the second BIA that we have is the Sonoma County Tourism BIA, which is a 2% assessment. Um, with that, uh, that's also remitted to the city along uh, uh, with the TOT that the hotel operators send, um, but 100% of that goes back out to Sonoma County Tourism. So we basically take that in, uh, calculate when it's, that it's remitted correctly, and then send it all out to Sonoma County Tourism. So the changes that we we're proposing to make is to increase the TOT by 2%, which would bring it from 9% to 11 and as you can see, uh, uh, right now at you know nine percent, we're the lowest in the county. The TOT would bring us right in the um, still actually pretty low. We would be what the third lowest in the in the county. However, when you consider all of the BIAs uh, included, that brings us up to sixteen percent. So that will make us equal to Healdsburg as being the, um, the highest in the county. Um, we, uh, again, TOT goes directly into the general fund uh, and we would estimate by making this change that we would uh, generate an additional $2 million uh, to the general fund annually. Uh, if you'd like, I could answer questions relative to TOT now or just hop straight into business license tax. Any questions? Not TOT specific now. TOT specific, I did have a question. So sure. the the 2% is going to be broken down like everything else. So the our 9% is not going to go to 11. It's going to... No, our 9% goes to 11. It will go strictly to... So it will go... That's what I thought you said. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure our general fund... Right. And and that's it. So so all we are doing is increasing TOT. That is a direct general fund revenue source that will go from 9% to 11% and will have the estimated uh, effect of increasing revenue by $2 million. I included the others because to be completely transparent, mm -hmm. all of those, those percentages are added. So when you increase the 2% the, the of TOT, it doesn't change the BIAs, but it changes the total amount that a uh, lodging person would pay. Would... I have one more. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, yeah, I got a question. Uh, hold on. Uh, and then my second question is um, for, and it probably, I'm not going to get it today, but uh, what exactly do we get from Santa Rosa tourism for the 70% of the 3% and from Sonoma County tourism for the 2%? I, know, I mean, I'm asking because I want to know. Yeah. One of these days, I'm not sure that you can tell me today if you can, Greg. Well, in general, uh, they provide um, uh, uh, marketing and, and tourism uh, uh, 
uh, they're they're boosting the tourism to bring people into uh, um, Santa Rosa specifically and uh, Sonoma County in general. Yes, so a lot of that, those funds go to administrative services and staff, and they have about 15 uh, organizations and events that they support, um, anywhere from uh, the Pride Parade to various golf tournaments, triathlons, and country summer. Okay, uh, and I asked um, because I've traveled probably multiple times in our Santa Rosa airport, and every single time I go, I look for a pamphlet for Santa Rosa or something that says the city of Santa Rosa on it. I see Hillsburg, I see Petaluma, I see every other um, every other city, pretty much. Even the smallest ones have something, but I don't see us. And I don't know whose responsibility that is. And that's, uh, since it's on here, it uh, I wanna bring it to whoever's attention. Um, that that is a problem for me being as though we're the largest city within our county and every single city is represented there. And you know what I mean? Yeah. The little pamphlets when you get off the air. So of course I know our area, but for people that don't, they're not going to know our city because we're not represented or not encouraged. People are encouraged to come here and that's a problem for me. So um, whoever takes care of that, if we can pass that, information Absolutely. along. Mark? Um, I, I guess I did think of one question that I had. Has there been any feedback from the from the local hotels with respect to bumping up the the, the TOT tax? Um, from them specifically, no. Okay. Uh, we did discuss this with the chamber and uh, um, he indicated, uh, Peter Rumble indicated that uh, um, that hotel operators may, may be sensitive to this uh, due to the fact that um, I, I guess from a revenue standpoint from, from where we are, our TOT is, is doing well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess uh, uh, the hotel operators would say that they are, are not doing so well. Um, great on the weekends, maybe not so much during midweek. Um, again, this is, this is, comes from the people that are coming in. And my, my thought would be that, um, uh, generally folks will go to a destination and go to a specific hotel and the amount of tax that they need to pay on that is, is, kind of an afterthought. I don't, I don't think you stop going to a city and a particular hotel that you're used to going to because it's an extra percent or so more. Um, that's anecdotal from me, but uh, I, you know, I, I'm sensitive to, to their issues. Um, that said, I'm also sensitive to the budget needs of Santa Rosa. Yeah, that's the line that we're trying to walk. Um, Sonoma County Tourism has done a nice job recently in terms of trying to break out what the what the foot traffic numbers up here are and what some of the some of the reasons are for the decline. Um, since we have been drawing fewer people in the county, um, and so I can I can imagine that the that the local um, hotels uh, would be somewhat sensitive in terms of the rates that they're charging because they're not able to put, pass all of this along to consumer like they might have been in 2019. Well, I, I will say this. We haven't changed this rate since 1993. Fair point. Yeah. Oh. It's low. Yeah. So, I mean, to the chair's point, uh, we have a couple of BIA that, you know, uh, uh, should be marketing, and should be drawing people here. Uh, it's concerning to me that you could go into our local airport and not see pamphlets for Santa Rosa. So, I mean, I think that maybe that's the place that we would look at more so than the TOT that the, that the uh, hotels pay. Fair point. Thanks for the context. Thanks, Member McDonald. 
Yeah, I just had a quick question is how do we um, make sure that any of the short term rentals that are currently in place or any Airbnbs and that are in place that are paying, I'm assuming they pay a TOT, but to make sure that whenever they are renting out, I know that's still a problem of us being able to track how much they're renting out. And so I feel like as we increase this, we need to make sure that that's cleaned up as well. It may be more revenue that we're not being able to capture. Right now, this is a contributing factor to our TOT going up, which is or the revenue uh, being as as uh, strong as it as it is with TOT. I know a lot of that is coming from the, uh, the short term rentals that we are now able to capture because we have the mechanism, the permitting mechanism in place to be able to to get that. So we do uh, track short term rentals. Uh, we do uh, uh, and track their their TOT payments, and part of their their uh, permit is that they are current with TOT payments. So uh, I I feel confident that we are capturing what we can. Of course, we always look at that. Um, I think there's more software, and I know we've talked about this in the past that finds those that aren't permitted, that are operating an Airbnb in the community. And so I just want to make sure that we're doing like all of that we can from a city's perspective so that it does feel more equitable because if somebody's renting out a space to a family, that is why they're not going to a hotel and using our hotel services because they might be able to be renting to somebody else that's not permitted, that has a house that's being advertised on Airbnb, but we're not permitting them and they're not captured somehow. So I just, this is great. I'm fine with this. You're right. It hasn't been updated since 1993. I think that that's been when I've gone out and people have talked about the business license and this to have something so outdated it's appropriate to be looking at this. It should have probably been done some time ago. So I'm comfortable being able to talk um, to, to, this, um, to this tax increase. And I, like Mayor, I do have a little bit of concerns over what we're getting on the SRT BIA and SCT BIA. And so I think that would be great to have them come and say what they're doing on our behalf. And in addition to that, um, I, I think that would be an important thing for us to be able to say, this is where your money is going. And then a question is, could you change that so that we actually are capturing however much money that would be? So, but then we would be doing our own work for marketing and that type of thing. I'm not saying I want to change that, but if we're giving money to somebody to market and the expectation is here, and they're not meeting those expectations, then what would it take to bring it in-house and be able to do it ourselves? Yeah, I'd, I'd have to look into that. I don't have a direct answer. So through the chair, uh, McDonald, a couple of your points. Um, so as it relates to checking on the accuracy and the validity of short-term rentals and making certain that we're capturing all that are uh, um, what is what I'm looking for? Um, Great. Thank you. Uh, Assistant City Manager Dunstan has had conversations with those vendors. We will continue to have conversations, you know, with those vendors. And when it's the right time, we'll make certain that we enter into agreement that that's what we need to do. Um, as it relates to SRT BIA, we're trying to um, transform the whole program, right? I think we probably could have done a better job in past years on monitoring SRT BIA, getting reports. So right now, um, Jill is setting, currently setting in that position, and she's working with the kit committee right now to make certain that we're monitoring our numbers. Is there anything that we can do in house? How do we leverage, um, you know, Sonoma County? I mean, uh, Santa Rosa. Excuse me, the chamber. Uh, to make certain that we are getting our fair share of marketing that we're driving in foot traffic. What are the dollars going to? We do know a lot of dollars go to staff, uh, but does that staff actually translate into, you know, foot traffic and to what they say, heads on beds, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we hear you. We do think, you know, we want to give it a year. I want to give it some time, see if the way we're restructuring it is working. Uh, and so we can bring that back to you and we can also have them come to this committee an update as well. That'd be great. 
or at least even to the full council, I think, because this is something that um, an open session, open session um, council member Fleming has mentioned, where is this money going to? It's about a half a million dollars. So it just might be of interest and also a way to let the public know what it is that we're doing. So I think they average about $400,000 a quarter. Maybe SRTBI is someone that way. I don't have that. <laughs> Why I should know that number, I don't know, but yes. That's it. That sounds good. <laughs> um, Any more questions, Councilman, uh, Councilmember Feisler? All right. So moving on to the next slide. So business license tax. So uh, this is a chapter in our uh, 6-04 in our Santa Rosa City Code. Uh, it was enacted in 1990. Um, we, uh, we have never done a major review or change of this ordinance since that, that time. Uh, what it establishes, the ordinance, is that any business operating uh, in the city of Santa Rosa pays a business tax. Tax is based on gross receipts. Um, there is a minimum tax of $25, so any uh, business with gross receipts between zero and $25 or $25,000 would pay $25. And then there's a maximum tax of $3,000. So you, if you're a large company um, and in generally the amount of gross receipts to the over that $3,000 cap is usually right around a million dollars annually, uh, uh, you're, you're capped. So you would not pay any tax over that amount. Uh, there are different rates uh, uh, per different business categories. We've got, uh, I wanna say about seven categories now, about five major categories, and then there's some small one-off ones. Uh, um, and they, uh, they have a different rate structure. So they, generally we, we charge the lowest rate to those that uh, contribute to Santa, Santa Rosa's tax base in other ways. So if they are say a retail business and they're generating sales tax, they have a low business tax rate. Uh, if they do not contribute to, the, to our tax base in other ways, they tend to have a larger, um, a larger tax rate. The current general fund revenue that we get from this is approximately $4.7 million. Uh, the way that our system works is that you, uh, it's based on a, a calendar year. They pay uh, uh, their tax between, uh, so if you're, renewing and, and paying your tax regularly. Uh, the time to do that is between January and February, although we do uh, allow until March uh, uh, for people to get caught up and not be delinquent. Um, uh, if somebody comes in uh, a new business, they would come in and pay a prorated tax amount based on their estimated gross receipts at that time. Um, and then catch up during the, the actual business tax payment period of January to February. Next slide. So last summer, uh, as we were looking at our, our general fund and what we can do to help um, uh, put us into balance, uh, we asked uh, HDL, who's our business tax, administration firm uh, to review uh, uh, the business tax ordinance um, to measure the effectiveness, city's current rate structure and offer recommendations based on their experience, expertise in the industry. Uh, what they found was that the city's current rate structure underperforms uh, compared to other cities of similar size and the main driver for that is that $3,000 maximum. Um, 
They uh, suggested that removing the cap would enable equity relative to the effective tax rates. That's something I'll show you later in the presentation. Um, they would uh, raise the rates to reflect uh, the um, where we are right now. Again, the rates were initially set in 1990 and they did not reflect the current uh, uh, state of the city's budget or just the cost of doing business in general. Um, and wherever pop or, uh, possible, we would uh, simplify uh, the rate categories. Next slide, please. Um, this, this is a comparison to our local uh, uh, cities within the county. Um, I'm, I'm often asked for this. I, I'll be perfectly frank. It doesn't really, it doesn't really have any benefit. Uh, we are, we're, we're odd in this. We're the only one that, that does our tax really the way that we do it. Uh, um, uh, and we're the biggest in the city. It's not the best comparable that we can use, but if I didn't put it in, I would be asked for it. <laughs> so maybe when you bring it forward to the whole group, we shouldn't. <laughs> I, I'm I'm fine leaving it out. I just it's oh, it's an easy down. thing for me to just slide right by and say next slide, please. Um, so what are our proposed changes? What we want to do is uh, uh, what we're proposing is to remove the maximum tax and create a hybrid tax structure. So we, um, and the way this would work is that we would protect small and medium-sized businesses by retaining the same tax structure that they have now. Essentially, if they're not paying the $3,000 maximum tax, their, their tax rate isn't gonna change. The amount that they pay us uh, uh, will stay reasonably the same. Obviously, if they have a little bit more uh, gross revenues, it would go up, but it would go up by the old tax structure. So what that is, and I'll get to that in the next slide, um, you'll, you'll see how low those taxes are. Um, but we want to keep them the same. Uh, where we are looking at is, are those businesses that generate more uh, gross receipts um, and, and go there. So from there, we would create a new track tax structure. We would keep our business categories relatively the same, but we would increase the, the, the actual tax rate based off of what we're seeing uh, other cities do, not clearly not locally, uh, but um, other ones do that have a similar type of structure. So we're kind of within those, those ranges and away from, from where we currently are. Um, we, would, uh, we would expand um, uh, the tax to include property rentals, um, uh, uh, businesses that rent um, uh, fewer than four residential units. Right now, if you uh, are a residential property um, owner, uh, uh, say an apartment complex, you'll, uh, you have multiple, you have more than four units, you pay a business tax. You are a, you have a, a small um, triplex, you're not, you're, you're still renting it out and operating it as a business, you're not paying a business tax. What this also does, and I think what's important with this, is that uh, it will allow us to charge a business tax to short-term rentals. Currently, if, if under this, if you are renting a residential property uh, and you have one, two, or three of those that you're doing, and typically people have the one, um, uh, we, they don't pay business tax. They are operating that as a business. We want to be fair and charge anybody that's operating a business 
if we're if we're legally allowed to charge that tax, we're going to charge the tax. Um, uh, what we are also seeing is there are a lot more uh, large investment corporations that are getting into the residential real estate uh, space. So this will allow us to look at that. What I will say, though, is that given the way our model works, um, we feel that most of the residential rentals will fall below the $3,000 threshold. So they will pay the tax, but they're not going to pay an exorbitant amount. Um, and under a, let's say we, we have a, uh, I had our consultants give us a, uh, an example of, let's say there's a single family home being rented out for 2,400 a month, which kind of seems like a bargain, but let's say it was that that's what they were doing. Um, the monthly rate would be, uh, 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 the tax that would be triggered on that uh, would be the old uh, amount, which is 84 cents per thousand dollars of gross receipts. If they were to pass that tax along to uh, their tenants on a monthly basis, it would be about two bucks. So we don't see this as being a harm to the tenants. We, uh, it should not be a, an undue harm to the to the operators. It brings fairness to all of that, and um, uh, and that's that's it. So what we would also do is it, are all of these changes we would propose to take effect in the 2026 business tax year. So it's not our intention to put something on the ballot in November. And then come January of 2025, have, have them pay an extra tax, especially some of the large businesses that would be affected probably pretty greatly under this. Um, we need them to, we think that it's fair to allow a year to get them into, uh, uh, into their business plan to be able to, uh, to make those payments. Uh, it is... Uh, somewhat of a challenge for us budgetarily, but it should be uh, affected or affect. It should show up in our 25-26 fiscal year, and revenue increase should this go through, uh, which will help us greatly. So, next slide, please. So. Um, these are what our current rates are and what we're proposing. So. Uh, as you can see, uh, we've got five main categories. We have a general uh, commerce and retail one. This includes retail establishments, wholesale, restaurants, manufacturing, auto sales, corporate headquarters. Um, our current rates is that you, it's, it's uh, uh, assuming they, they make more than $25,000, they would pay the first $25 off of that $25,000, and then it's $0.39 cents per thousand of, of gross receipts with a maximum of $3,000 tax paid. For services such as lawn care, beauty, salons, property rentals, camp, uh, convalescent care, we're looking at the same $25 plus $0.84 cents per thousand um, no, I should have said, so before with the, with the retail, we're taking from the 39,000 per thousand and we're moving it up to a uh, dollar 50 per thousand, uh, of gross receipts with no cap for the services. We're taking the 84, uh, cents per, uh, thousand with the, the maximum gross tax of $3,000 and turning it to 250 per thousand uh, of gross with no cap and on down the slide with uh, the uh, 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 commercial rental uh, being 350 and uh, professionals such as doctor's offices, attorneys, accountants, 
uh, also at 350. Uh, next slide, please. That was a lot. That was a lot. Sorry. Yeah. Absorb that for a second. I think I, I work better to like when we take it back to council, yeah. we get like hypotheticals for reals. Like I have a small salon. I make this much money. This is how much I pay now. This is how much I'm going to pay. I make $3 million. This is what I pay now. This is how much I'm going to pay. I yeah. think to put it in perspective, like I make $3 million. This is how much I'm going to pay. This is an increase, yeah. right? We, that's the way my brain Right, we can do works. that. That's, but that's, when you just looked at, I'm like, huh? No, I understand. Okay. Uh, we um, trying to think. Yeah, we we can absolutely do that. Uh, in addition, uh, when we go to the full council for study session, I'll also have the consultant there with us and to help walk through that. So that'll provide some other um, some uh, uh, additional color to to our presentation. All right, um, going on to the next slide is our methodology for this. So we, what we're trying to do is create a more equitable, effective tax rate structure. Uh, um, it's inequity is caused uh, singularly by the $3,000 maximum tax cap. Um, again, we, uh, uh, we are not uh, the reason why we came up with the hybrid method and not just changing everybody's rate structure to this new one, um, it, we couldn't guarantee that a small business wouldn't pay more than what they're paying now and wouldn't pay more than that $3,000. So we wanted to make sure that we, that's why we broke the two up. Um, the new rates are in line with other cities with similar structures uh, and the lowest rate for general retail uh, they, they do uh, uh, provide other taxes to the city and tend to have low profit margins and we wanted to um, treat all businesses the same including short term rentals so a lot of what I've covered before leading up to this. So in the next slide, we show how we compare with other cities should we move to this proposed thing, uh, uh, rate structure. So again, you have, um, uh, what you can see is that in terms of general retail, we would, uh, Tracy Sausalito and Pico Rivera have very similar um, uh, uh, rate structures. Pico Rivera actually has uh, um, the same gross over 25,000, the same that we do. Uh, um, in all cases, we are proposing a dollar 50 while they're proposing, while they have a dollar. Um, I will say that in the, uh, uh, Sausalito, uh, restructured their tax to this format in 2019. Um, they're currently, well, uh, their budget data is a little bit old, but from what I can tell, uh, at least in fiscal year 22, their budget, uh, their revenue estimates was 1.6 million. Um, prior to their restructuring, it was about 600,000. So uh, uh, it increased from there. I have no budget data with Tracy. Um, uh, it, yeah, they're they're. You should be happy. Your online budget information is far better than many cities that I that I look at. So uh, Pico Rivera is another one that recently restructured. Um, I believe theirs was in 2023, where they had revenue that was 2.1 million. Now they're estimating it at about 6.4. If you look at where we are proposing. If, if under this rate structure, our estimates are that we will go from that 4.7 to 16.8 million. So it is a, a, a significant uh, um, increase of revenue to the general fund, uh, sorely needed revenue to the general fund. 
next slide. So this is a um, maybe kind of hard to read under there. What what this is showing on a on a very broad level is is that of the uh, close to thirteen thousand businesses that we have registered in Santa Rosa, um, uh, a little over four hundred will be affected by the tax and will pay more than three thousand dollars as they were before. The majority of those in in this and this is again an estimate. Um, could be 300, 325 would pay uh, um, uh, between 3,000 and 23,000. So the majority of the businesses that will be affected by this will pay a relatively small amount. On the other side of the scale, you've got about 20 or so that would pay more than $100,000. Hence why we, I, I think, giving a year to allow them to get that into their business plan would be um, would be welcome for them. Can you give us an example about what those businesses are? Um, so there's confidentiality rules with that. I could say that in, uh, um, you know. In other jurisdictions, what that would be? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. <clears throat> well, for an example, if somebody's paying $100,000 in oh. Pico Rivera at a Costco, it makes sense to me based on gross receipts. Yeah. Uh, so in, in, in no way am I going to be able to find out or be able to tell <clears throat> what the individual tax amounts of, of businesses in other cities would be. Right. I know what they are in here. I can't say it. Uh, it would be there. There's legal restrictions on that. What I could say is that in general, a big box wholesaler would see an increase. that's more than $1,000. Okay. Thank you. Um, on the next slide, uh, we talked about effective tax rate. This shows under this plan, the model four is the plan that we are working with. Um, that's our hybrid tax model. Uh, what you can see, especially if you look in the second uh, uh, set of information, the effective tax rate, we go from having large businesses um, that had an effective tax rate of about three, uh, 0.03% uh, goes up to 0.18%. Um, so it, it, it distributes that a little bit better, but it does keep uh, your small and medium businesses the same. Again, just trying to be as fair as we can in the, in the business place. And you can see there that where we are uh, uh, we'll get the majority of the revenue that comes in will be on the general retail side uh, um, and then followed by uh, the professional businesses and uh, contractors and service industry. Rentals are pretty low. And finally, on the next slide, we have our next steps. So we're doing this presentation here. July 9th, we'll do a study session for the full council. Uh, July 23rd, we will uh, come back to council with the report item that will uh, recommend that we um, approve these ordinances and move them to the uh, registrar of voters. Uh, they are due to the registrar of voters on, on August ninth um, and uh, we will continue our public outreach like I said we we've met with a representative of the chamber um, uh, we intend to meet with the downtown action organization um, and other business groups we are working uh, with our communications team and uh, um, 
revenue consultant to develop educational materials. So there'll be a website, there will be mailers, there will be the general things that, that we can provide that educates the uh, electorate um, of what we are trying to do and the reasons for it and what the benefits of this will be uh, for the community as a whole. So with that, tight 45 minutes. Uh, if there's any additional questions, comments, I'm here for all of those. I did have a question. Um, I, I know people often look at like uh, Costco, right? Because everyone throws the dough at Costco. Um, but I'm thinking like uh, people throw a lot of money at like plastic surgery and reconstructive dental stuff. I mean, so, but I know that they are in that because I've seen it, right? We're like, uh, but what about the larger medical facilities? Is there an exemption? Sorry, it's just my own curiosity. Is there an exemption for like Kaiser? Because, you know, Kaiser has a for-profit, a not-for-profit, uh, and then Sutter. Do you know what I'm asking? I think so. Okay. I think you're treading in an area where this is going to be difficult for me to, to explain. Yeah. Never mind. I, I will say that <laughs> that large uh, that that the increase that the increased tax amount uh, will hit uh, many of the areas that you're talking about. So yes, it will hit contractors. It will hit uh, professional buildings such as professional medical buildings, as well as auto dealerships general retail, it's like that. In general, if you are making more than a million dollars a year in gross receipts in your business, you're probably going to see an increase. There are some that make a hundred million dollars plus, you know, uh, in that area of, of gross receipts, they are probably going to see, no, not probably, they, they will won't. see a significant increase in this tax. Well, they should have a savings account by now. Because we've only been charging three thousand uh, dollars, they saved a lot of money. Uh, yes. Not anything for me? No, I think that this is. I mean, honestly, this seems fair to me. And I own a small business, so I appreciate that the protection of small and medium-sized businesses that have one to five employees that aren't making much more than a million dollars in gross receipts won't see a huge um, increase. Um, some things we might want to consider and convey a message would be a lot of times, even a small business, they pay for equipment, they pay for cost of goods, they're paying a tax on that already. Um, when those come in, they, they are part of the equation of gross receipts, right? Because it's, it, it does offset, but the gross receipts are still high. It feels sometimes like a double tax, if that makes sense, because they're paying already those um, fees for their cost of goods sold. So I'll use equipment as, um, because this is what I know, HVAC equipment, we pay a tax on that already for that, but the business tax doesn't take that into account that those cost of goods sold, um, you know, it all plays part of your gross receipts. Is that, is that not making sense? No, it makes sense. So it, it feels like a double tax a little bit. That said, again, smaller businesses, if you're making a million, to, you know, $2 million, you probably are a tiny business. And so I think keeping the rates um, relatively the same on that is a fair thing to do. I think that'll um, sit well in the community when we go out and speak about this, that we're still trying to protect the small businesses in Santa Rosa. Um, it's hard to feel sorry for a business, no matter the establishment, when they're making a hundred million dollars and they've operated in our city on, on a, a very low tax for that. So I don't think it's um, proper to necessarily compare us to the other little jurisdictions because we're such a large city. I, I'm happy to see that you have other cities that are similar to our size and their structure because we, we shouldn't compare to like a Cloverdale or Katati, how they do their budgeting is, is far different than us and including their um, revenue and, and what the responsibility for each of those jurisdictions is different as well. So overall, I think it's a great presentation. It makes a lot of sense to me how you've done it. 
and uh, I appreciate all the research that went in to making this a fair, equitable way of increasing revenue, but, um, you know, by keeping, keeping what was had in place. So thank you. I don't understand what you said. Can I just clarify real quick? Which part? You said, well, the, you said that a business pays tax when they sell something or buy something? When they buy something. So say I have to order five pieces of equipment, right? And I have a um, job that I'm doing for a hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. I buy that five pieces of equipment. I pay tax on that equipment already. When I do my taxes, I don't have to pay tax to the IRS again on that one. But the gross receipts I'm paying tax on. So I'm taxed twice because I'm paying tax on that, but that's part of this um, job that I'm getting for $100,000. The cost of the equipment is part of that $100,000. When I'm taxed on that gross receipt, it feels like you're taxed twice because you don't back out the cost and that you're spending on your equipment. You're taxed on that full hundred. So there's no way a, a business can no. separate what they actually earn from a. That would be net, not gross. So these are gross receipts, and I think that's the piece that is confusing to people, and I think that's the piece where. Um, you get some concern over retailers where they're saying, oh my gosh, but I need tax on this versus um, the tax structure that we have in place. That is the current structure. I'm not saying that we need to change it. I'm just saying this is something that I've seen where it feels like you're getting hit twice because you actually are. Can I give you an example really quick? So when you go to a mechanic, the mechanic says, this is what was, uh, this is the parts. And so, and this is what the labor was, right? And so I'm not really paying them. I'm paying for the parts. They're not paying for the parts. I'm paying for the parts. I'm paying them for the labor, which would be a part of their growth because okay. I'm just reimbursing them for the parts. So I don't really understand if they, when I say separate it, if they separate it, how because they're they, being taxed twice. When they report it to the city of Santa Rosa, they add the part and that because that bottom line is a gross receipt. Mm. Okay. So oh, I, I, I know that you've been running it. I, I, get, I, that's, that's, like, I, I don't just know can tell you from our own structure and doing these business license and how you back it out and what, if when you're doing business and we do several of them, we do it here, Petaluma, any place you do business, you must fill out a business license tax. And so I just think that's something to be aware of when we're we're increasing on things. It's just my perspective and what I've I've learned over time. So mm -hmm. I feel like I get taxed a lot too. Yeah. IRS don't want to hear me. Yeah, okay. I'm not hundred percent aware of that too. Yes. Sorry. Oh, I was well, trying to understand. Good conversation and really good, really good presentation. Um, I think we've all been looking forward to this. I like the I like the emphasis on. The reason for us going through this is not simply because the, the city wants more revenue. Obviously, that's true, but it's because we really do, we really do need to update our our business license business license fee. <clears throat> um, it needs to be fair. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't make as much sense as it could. So that's all to the good. Um, and in addition, we could we could use the revenue. I like the note about the the SROs too suddenly falling under the business tax. I didn't realize that we weren't that they weren't getting charged right now. So that's uh, a really helpful. So the short-term short rentals. Oh, I said SROs. SROs. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> SDR. Sorry about that. Sorry to our SROs up there. <laughs> Let me just make sure I got a few numbers straight. So if the TOT, if, if these re revenue measures were to go through as scripted, the TOT starting in 2025 would bring in $2 million annually? Or is that, is that 2026 as well? Uh that would actually, we would start bringing money in. Uh, that would go into effect in the middle of fiscal year 24, 25. Okay. And that would be, so on, and, on, it would be estimated 2 million annually thereafter. Thereafter. Yes. Okay. So in very round terms, yeah. maybe we get an added million in that first year, but I would look at it in, 25, 26, and I hope would, we would see a full year of that higher revenue. Understood. And then starting in, in 20, 
well, starting in fiscal year 26, we would start to expect around 12 million extra for the business license fee. Yeah. If we start bringing in whatever that is, 16.7 yeah. million, something like yeah. that. So yeah. once it's all up and running, it's it's roughly 14 million a year estimated to the to the general fund. That's that's the estimate, yes. Okay. Which is um always like to contemplate that that picture. Uh and I so my question is I think ultimately they're all they're ultimately curiosity about how the how the consultant approach this. Um, because you've had the, the full report, and I'm sure there were lots of there was lots of context given into why they chose, why the consultant chose the matching cities. I guess one general question is, is this the way that municipalities, regardless of size, are, are going across the country right now? Is this a general trend? Um, well, I don't know about across the country. Uh, in California, from what we're seeing, there's, there's really a couple of ways you could go about it. There are folks that have a gross receipts tax, and those that do tend to have the categories that are similar to ours and the rate structures that are similar to ours. Yeah. We may be, what we're proposing here may be um, uh, on the high side, but they're within the, 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 the range of what, of what you're seeing out there. With that the other way yeah. to go about it is like a per employee tax um, and to do it in, in that way. But uh, uh, I wouldn't recommend doing a complete radical change of our tax structure in that way. And I don't, in fact, I know it wouldn't benefit us. That was pointed out early on. You're, you, you have the gross receipts. It's a good formula to use. Update it. Get rid of the cap. And, uh, and, and go, go from that, that direction. So they, um, uh, they, they are a tax administrator for a lot of municipalities in California. Plus, they just have a general overall knowledge of tax base. There's really two of them in, in, the, in the state. Uh, and they, I believe, go outside of the state, but I'll just talk about California, that are the two major players of this type of revenue analysis. The other one is our actual revenue consultant. Um, uh, uh, but I went, I did the work here with HDL because they are specifically our tax administrator. And that, that all made sense. I guess I'm trying to get a better picture for what the context is both locally and then and statewide. If we can go back to that business tax slide where we, where we compared it to the other cities in the county. Yeah. Um, in our county, in our county, we had the we had the Cloverdale through Wind Wind yeah. this thing. Yeah. Uh, slide six, I think it was. Yeah. So, under this, under the proposed, sorry. Um, yeah, it's not a problem, Shelley. But even we can work off our copies. Un under the proposed measure or the proposed business license fee update, we would start bringing in about sixteen twenty million a year. The next highest. Tax, the next highest tax to revenue number in the county is Petaluma at 1.2 million. So the city of Santa Rosa would be charging 14 times more than anybody else in the county. Yeah, that that's so a that's one. The other the other cities in the county have caps that yeah. take them out of this. We, really, to compare ourselves with the other cities, even Petaluma. Um, is, is, it doesn't really, it's apples and oranges. We are so here, completely so here, different. So here's our goal, because that's, that's true. And this doesn't necessarily, I think there, I think there are reasons why we would, why we would, why we'd have, we would have this, this difference. Um, I'm putting myself in the, in the mindset of, let's say, let's say, uh, and you've got the choice of coming to Santa Rosa where let's just let's just assume the business license fee is you know it's it's a six figure number, as opposed to heading down to Auto Row and Petaluma, where I'm assuming that 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 was a typo at forty five dollars. Is there a forty five hundred dollar cap? No. no, I thought that as well. But so if they cap, if Petaluma caps it at forty five bucks, I believe so. Well, they need to review that also. Um, I, but it, it goes it goes to the point where you know it, it, I don't think any business is going to relocate, especially if, you know if we're talking healthcare facility or some large firm, this isn't going to be enough to, to push anyone out of the city. 
but for larger firms that are coming in, whether it's an auto dealership, whether it's a big box retailer, like the kind of Montgomery Village you're trying to recruit, is this going to be a factor in that conversation? Well, I, I would hope not. I, it, well, let me put it this way. Sure. I mean, they're going to see what our rates are. They're going to see that, that, that you know, you're not paying a cap. And, and uh, uh, so they, they would work that into their plan to have business there. What I would say, though, is that um, there are a lot of reasons to come to Santa Rosa. And for all of those, I would probably want that over going to another place just for a lower tax. I think, I think that's right. And I think you're getting to the heart of where, or the sort of the number of where my head's going is how do we, what is our, our case for support here? Um, well, we're, here's, here's another example, just to, again, I'm, I'm throwing this out a little bit random. If you can cut back to the TOT slide, Shelley, for a second. I was, as we were going through that, I was trying to um, remember, remember a few figures. I don't think Healdsburg is actually paying that county BIA, right? They're they, both they and Sonoma have opted out. So Healdsburg's number, Healdsburg's number, I think, is only 14%. And then with the county, with the Sonoma County figure, are they really paying 15% or is it, is it actually 14 to 12? No, it's 15. It's just added. Uh, they just increased theirs. I think it just went in. It went up. That. Okay. Um, and I, you know, I, you may be right, but I, I looked at that stuff at least within this, in the, in the last year. Okay. So if I, I'm pretty sure that's, that's it. Um, Let, let's confide. I, 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 I will. You take, you take, you take the me, point. Yeah. I, I will make the change if it's, if, if I'm wrong. Yeah, and that's, and that's just that's an a, apology note to Healdsburg. This, um, this is, but, this is Healdsburg, Healdsburg should be paying too. We can we can send out memos to the other cities about yeah. what they should be doing differently with their budgets. Um, and, but again, it, it speaks to the point where Santa Rosa is going to be. Che- and again, I don't want the, I don't want this to indicate a lack of support on my part. It's just that if we move forward with this with this measure, Santa Rosa is going to be clearly a high tax, the highest tax. Municipality in the in the in the in the county, whether we're talking TOT or whether we're talking business tax, which we can justify. To your point, there's a story that can be told about what, what why that's actually that actually means to better better services for the community, better services for business. Why it's why businesses will will bring in more revenues if they do locate here. I just think we need to be really clear that that's what we're doing. That we are we are turning ourselves into the highest tax entity in the county. And have and have really clear reasons for for our business community about what they're going to gain from that. Yeah, uh, and a- absolutely, that's that's um, and that'll be a, a concerted effort for us to do that, especially in our economic development. Did, did the chamber? Did the chamber have thoughts? Did the chamber have any have, have ways to to talk about this? Um, I'm I'm not going to speak for this. Yeah. the chamber. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I, if, when, like, my, in my informal polling with the, with some of the local business community, um, there is there's conceptual openness to this. So I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a naysayer. Businesses understand why this why something like this might make sense. Right. But they do want a clear story to tell. Yeah. And and understood. And um, uh, I'm waiting. Just to- do I, do I see wiggling down? No, 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 I'm still going. I'm still, the leash hasn't been pulled yet. So um, uh, uh, the so that's a fair point. And and yes, uh, um, there there are marketers better than I that that can tell that story and will tell that story. What I will say is this: um, we are, I think, all cities. Are faced with uh, uh, with economic and budgetary challenges right now. We've talked about this uh, um, uh, myself and the council of where we are. You've seen our forecast. You know where we're we're headed. Uh, the 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 council. Um, understands that that we need to be creative 
and looking for uh, um, revenue. Uh, and one of the things, and, and it's embarrassing that, that we haven't looked at business tax and reviewed that ordinance in 34 years. Um, you know, I, I don't know why, why that is, but that was the first thing we started looking at is, well, what, what we haven't done, we didn't want to just go back to sales tax. That's, that is, that is regressive. Yeah, agreed. And, um, and we, now I'm not saying that in the future, you won't see me come up or him come up and say, Hey, we need, we need to revisit our sales tax amount. But for where we are right now, we we thought that the that the best way to move forward is to look at these ordinances that we haven't looked at for ever or at all, and uh, uh, and bring them into the twenty first century, which is what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. and I and I want I want to be clear that I'm fully supportive, and I like that I like okay. the plan as as yeah. presented. I guess I'm putting on my economic development hat yeah. and I'm thinking about our team who's going to be out there talking to businesses and right, right next to Petaluma I, and Rotary no, Park. I, and, they're, and they're going to be explaining why, why a firm should, should locate here rather than there. Yeah. And this is going to have to be something they're going to, they're, they're, they're going to have to talk through this. I, I, I understand that. And, and, and uh, it is challenging for me as well. Uh, uh, but uh, again, it, it is, it's necessary. Understood. One final and much easier question, just as I'm, as I'm thinking about the local business community, who's going to respond to this. Um, oh, sorry. I got time for one more. Yes, sir. We, uh, real estate agents or real estate offices, where do they fit in in those list of categories? Are they, are they professionals? I, I believe service. Sorry, are they professional? I believe so, but yeah, okay. we would need to check. Yeah. Let me, we, we, let me double we check. Cause okay. I, yeah. Uh, no worries. I, just, I know I'm going to get that question. Okay, I, I will. I will. I will email the the group the the right answer on that. All right, and I'll, I'll chime in for a brief moment for a clarity on the Hillsburg issue since I just looked it up because I was remembering something similar to you, uh, Vice Mayor. They are at sixteen percent, but their two percent in question here goes to their own Hillsburg Tourism Improvement District. Oh, got it. Okay, which is the county. There so we it go. should be under local. Yeah, I need to take a look at the chart again, Shelly, to see how we bucket it. But but to your point, that they are at sixteen percent, but that BIA county that should that should be zero. It should be their own local two percent. Okay, but well, I'm still I'm, I'm actually glad to see them still at sixteen percent. I mean, makes yeah, it yeah. If, if you're going to go and and rent a room and it's still, still the sixteen percent, yeah, you got it. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, you got it. So that's just so kind of where that I'll, is. I'll create a new column. And they'll they'll be the Jesus stands alone for that one. If there's any way to to, to make it clear that we're not meeting staff, that's helpful. Yep. That's, that's it for me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just on a final thought on a TOT, we've had um, lots of conferences in jurisdictions such as Anaheim. I don't know if you ever looked at the TOT in Anaheim, but. You know their draw is obviously Disneyland and and what they offer there, and it's it's far higher than sixteen percent to stay there. In addition to several other taxes that they have to help maintain the area, so I think when we're looking at Sonoma County, when we're looking at Santa Rosa and what we have to offer, I still think this is an appropriate amount. It's just doing our part to support the businesses to help convey the messages, but we're still far from what I've seen in other areas and. It makes me, you know, feel like we just are behind on some of these things. So it feels a little more like sticker shock because they haven't had it in place in a long time. Um, but I think it's necessary for us to be able to maintain our services in Santa Rosa. So again, thanks for the presentation. Thank you. The mayor, have a quick response to that? Yes. I, because you're, the point you're making is, is completely valid um, and ultimately I'm persuaded. I'm just thinking about going out to the local, in particular the local tours and hospitality community, where their numbers have dropped in recent years. We're still not back to 2019. The revenues are down. And our, going back to them with the story of the city needs money, we're going to take it from you. 
that's going to be that's going to be a difficult conversation with 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 those those businesses. So we're going to have to have a clear story about why this is good for the entire community and why they will benefit in the long run. I think there is that story out there. We just got to be careful that we're we're all on the same page with that. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mark. Um, and to, I will say when Alan and I began this journey to determine, you know, how do we increase revenue? You know, you have sales tax, you have business tax. Sales tax is the easy way to go, right? But again, it's regressing, right? Um, do we need additional revenue? Yes. I think people forget we have to pay the increasing cost for services too, so we want to continue to provide a high level of service to our constituents. Um, and trash cost goes up, we have to pay for that. PG&E cost goes up, the city has to pay for that as well. Um, so, you know, we do try to manage our fiduciary responsibility the best way that we can, but there are just some cost customers that we cannot avoid as well. So, you know, Having the public understand that, you know, when your costs go up, our cost of services go up too. Uh, we try to maintain that, you know, we try to be, you know, efficient uh, staff wise. Uh, but sometimes we just cannot afford that either. You know, if you look at our PG&E costs, uh, what, 17% across the city, you know, that's, we don't budget for that, you know, and PG&E PG &E costs are going to continue to go up. What other costs are going to continue to go up? Services and supplies are going to continue to go up. So, you know, it's something that we're managing. But, you know, expenditures are going to continue to outweigh revenues. Uh, and it does cost more to provide services. We hope that our constituents feel that our services, you know, are exceptional and will continue to operate in that fashion. But when we did go down this road, sales tax, you know, kind of wasn't an option for us. We don't, you know, you talk about equity. We don't, we don't want to tax, you know, the people who are already burdened. So, and, you know, and this is regressive too. You know, you look at the equity on business tax. Why should a small business pay the same amount as a box store? And, you know, not specifically calling out a box store, but it, it, it's, it's not fair. So, you know, we have to weigh that as well. So all decisions are hard, but, you know, we just have to determine you know, what services are we going to continue to provide and at what level are we going to provide it? And again, we hope our constituents feel like we're providing them with the best level of service. So thank you for the presentation. Uh, thank you for all the work that went into the presentation. Um, I would have liked to see this done uh, in phases starting a long time ago because it hasn't been changed since I was eight. And yes, I'm getting up there. So that is a very long time. Um, so it's unfortunate to me that it has to, that we're doing it now and it's like one big like whoop for a, a larger business that has um, a lot of gross receipts, but it is something that we need to do. And we care about our small businesses as well as our large businesses. So. Um, it's not that we care about one more um, more than another, but it is fair to make it equitable. And just to, because Petaluma was pointed out, there we have a lot of differences uh, from Petaluma, including our, our size, for one. Um, and there's a lot of differences. Uh, between how Petaluma does things. And I, I've also seen in the past where Santa Rosa might do something and then some of the other smaller cities will look at how they can also do it too. So uh, a lot of times we are our leaders in our, in our county. Um, and so it opens the door to tell people that it is okay and we know that we're all going through something and we need to figure out how we do this. Um, I've gotten nothing but praise um, and I'll just start with downtown with the services that we've been providing um, downtown. For me, we want to continue to provide uh, those services and that is important. And I think uh, I've all been focusing on downtown. Uh, we want to provide those services all over, um, but we need funding to do that. So, um, and with that, if no one else has anything, I am a yes. For, like I think it's really important that council looks at this as a whole and that we um, 
bite the bullet and do something that we haven't done in a really long time. And being a, a, a business owner, um, it's never great when you have to pay more, but it, I mean, it, it's the cost of doing business, honestly. And I, and I say that kind of, but it really is the cost of doing, um, of doing business. And so however we can, uh, I think vice mayor is right. However, we can make people understand that it's not only, uh, when, when we can, if we can in certain areas, definitely we'll try to add services, but I am worried about maintaining the current services that we have, especially when you come to us and you say uh, we have a deficit because we're trying to continue the services at where we where we have been giving them, right? And so I don't want the services to be less and we're paying you, we're asking you to pay more. I want them to be where they are maintained or, or more, right? Um, because we do know of cities that are, are, are not doing very well right now. Um, and so that is, that's not a good look either. Um, so again, thank you. Thank you for uh, looking out of the box. Um, because I think in the past, people would have just said, let's go get, raise the sales, the sales tax. So finding an alternative way for us to, to approach this. Um, I do ask uh, for Vice Mayor's point that we're provided with uh, as much information as not a PowerPoint, yeah. but uh, key, yeah. key points that we can kind of walk through um, with the businesses so that they know how it's going to not only affect them, but like put it in layman's like, right. you know, real context. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it might be like $40. And that may be what I spend on my Starbucks. You know what I mean? It, and people think like, oh, this is a lot. But unless you're making a lot, it might not really like yeah. be all that much. Yeah. Uh, and we are working on that. Our comms team and our consultant are working on, on those things. And just to follow up on the real estate broker thing, that's a, uh, it's a service category. Thank you. All right, so let me go to my other screen. Sorry about that. So we'll now take a public comment on item 4.1. I do see a member of the public um, in the audience, but they're not making eye contact right now. <laughs> so I'm gonna guess she doesn't have anything to say. Um, so we're going to close public comment on item uh, 4.1, and we're going to look to see if there are any possible future agenda items. I know that uh, the SRT BIA was brought up, um, so that could be a possible future agenda item. Um, I'm, talking about real estate property transfer tax. I'm sorry, what? Yes. Real estate property transfer tax. Okay. And real estate property transfer tax. Okay. So, uh, so for the eleventh, or for July. well, I think we probably need to coordinate um, yeah. the latter with housing because yeah. that money, yeah, uh, we'll need to understand the impacts it has on the housing authority. Understood, understood. So we'll uh, with Megan. Our next scheduled meeting is July eleventh. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we will we will work on an agenda from there if. We we run up short or not, we may push that to August. Will it will it be included how the um, impact fees are allocated? So no, we are gonna bring you back that policy in September. Okay. So impact fees are coming back in September. But that's been a policy decision. Okay, that's been a question. And so I just want to make sure that we're able to have a, a really good understanding of how the impact fees themselves are allocated, where they're allocated, who makes a decision. Oh, allocations. So, so you um, mean park fees, I'm sorry, the quadrants. No, all impact impact fees that we, um, that we collect as a city. What are we collecting? What is a percent? If someone's building a building, what exactly are they paying? What, where do they go? How are they allocated? Who makes the decisions where they go? 
Um, is it is it by ordinance? Did we make the decision? I, I want to get to the nitty gritty all the way down to the find is grain of salt of why we do things that we do and to look and see if we need to possibly change any of that, if it's benefiting our organization the way we're doing it. Yeah, can I ask a clarifying question there? Of course. What I'm hearing, what I'm hearing from you is you would like an all-inclusive item. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Yes, sir. Of everything. Yes, sir. Can that run parallel with the focused on impact fee deferrals item that we're talking about in September? How? And parallel with park development quadrants? As it can so I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that. I'm, I'm however, you. however, it is one easiest for staff to present it to us, uh, giving us a better understanding. And also, um, so yes, I don't mind when you give it to us. Thank I'm you. just saying thank you that I want it all inclusive. I will defer to my city manager, but what I would suggest for, the, for this group and for council is that because each of those items is so dynamic, and so such a heavy lift policy wise, I think we can accomplish both by keeping them separated, mm -hmm. but also having that greater perspective with the items. So I, so I would suggest that we continue the path staff is taking on these, but again, I'll, I'll look for your feedback and direction from my city manager. I, I, think just, I need a bigger picture though. Yeah, Understood. I think from one conversation that we discussed during the budget study session, it was the quadrant system. Um, and I know some of you talked about equity and should we break it up based on uh, districts as opposed to the four quadrants. So I know we're going to bring that back at some point. Uh, if you want just kind of an overview of how uh, the impact fees are allocated, um, we, we can go back as a team and figure out what, you know, what's best for, for this, this body. Yes, if I may, Mayor. One of the things, and I'll just use this as an example, is I get a question um, how much money are we spending on homeless services? So four million dollars is how much? Four million. Four million. Okay. But where the money comes in from, and then what is our general fund is not clear in budget presentations. When it comes to impact fees, it is important for us to know here's the project, here's how all the money comes in and how it's distributed. This portion goes to park impact fees. This portion goes to these impact fees. And then under that, what does that actually mean? Park impact fees is this much money. It's broken up into quadrants and it goes into this bucket. And this is who gets to decide where that money is spent exactly. That is a piece that council is not getting on impact fees or on other budget items which helps us understand, I think, in a better way from a policy's perspective. One, is that a problem, right? Like how it's distributed? Or is it a policy problem? Like we're charging too much for say affordable housing for the low and very low, and we can break it down. But until we understand first how the money comes in, where that bucket of money goes, and then all the little buckets that it goes into, that's the part that I think is hard from this side of the day is to be able to say, these buckets we don't like anymore. So we're going to put it all in this one. And so it feels very much from my perspective that it's very staff driven on where that goes versus from a policy standpoint that we would feel more comfortable shifting how that's working because we don't find that it's working well, at least for a temporary time to your point of suspension versus, no, this is a long-term fix we want to have in place versus like a park impact or quadrant conversation. So I think that that's where coming to this group first to help us vet that out so that when we present to council and the public and in general, I think would be very helpful. Is that how you Yeah, I wasn't there? very, I wasn't very interested in the quadrant so much that's a just, separate yeah but just like where the broader like where what what are the fees where do they go exactly percentages all that um so i can have a better understanding so that i can explain it to people yeah. when they ask like well where is this going why is it going here who's doing this well i, I thought you were a council member why you're not <laughs> why don't you know and why is it this so yeah just to be more transparent for us. Yeah, and I think we can all agree 
uh, the CIP projects are going to come back to the full body. So you can make a recommendation on which projects you would like to see moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the process probably has not been as transparent in the past. We want to make certain that you have an opportunity for it as a governing body to say, uh, let's no, we, we would like to do this first. So we're going to bring that back to you during this um, budget cycle. Um, I think if there are concerns or questions about um, budget study sessions and information and how it's prevent, um, presented, um, we would be happy to take recommendations because we want to be transparent. and We want the public to understand like what is being put out there. So if you don't understand it, then that means 90% of the people don't understand it. So we're, we're open to that feedback as well. This is when you get into this kind of thing is when we have deficits and when we're going to tax increases. And that's like why I think we're starting to say we want a little bit more granular information on the budget because we are the ones that actually have to go out and explain it to people. And so I think that from my perspective, as well as what, what you know, as well as what Mayor was saying, is that's helpful to us to support what we're trying to do for this city. And so um that, that's what I, at least would be also very helpful from my perspective because I get asked questions on the budget a lot. And right now we're getting asked even more of them. And I would like to point out, uh, I did not bring this up to say that staff is doing anything wrong. I brought it up for an uh, organizational standpoint. When we see something that wasn't looked at or that we were doing the same way since I was eight years old, um, I know that you guys can only do so much, right? So if you're right in the middle of something, which I know you are, we can, I'm not saying this has to come to us July 11th or this needs to come. I'm saying when you can fit it in, please do fit it in because I think it would be beneficial for, for us to know. I think you guys are doing a fabulous job. Um, and I think our staff are doing a fabulous job. But if we can support and assist you in a way that we can do from a policy standpoint, and I would like to look at how we do things, why we do things, and what we can and cannot change to support our, our staff, because that is our job. Your job is to execute. It's our job to support you and give you the tools for execution. And I think that that is really important and that we need to stay on top of doing that. And again, a policy that wasn't changed since, we were, since I was eight, I won't say we, since I was eight, is not a good look. So I would just like to take the time while I'm on council to look at some of the things that we can possibly look at to make some changes, not to raise fees, not to, but maybe to reallocate where things go. Maybe they don't need to go here. Maybe they can go there. Maybe it can go here temporarily because we see a vision of where we want to go. And so we want to dedicate uh, funds to, to this project or to this, to finalize something or to get something over the finish line. So again, I think you guys are doing great. You guys are wonderful. I love our staff dearly all departments, um, and I'm not a very good liar, so you guys know that I'm telling the truth. <laughs> um, so with that, I think that that was it for future uh, agenda items, and so we will adjourn the meeting at uh, 4.59. Thank you very much. <laughs>